There are those who pride themselves on their ability to sense danger and swerve out of its path just in the nick of time. Sometimes it works, but when it doesn't, it's too late to cry. It is written. This is George Vandeman. Today, It Is Written presents Too Late to Cry. The mass migrations of Buffalo in America's earlier days must have been an incredible sight. One settler described a herd on the Kansas prairie in these interesting words. The herd, he said, was no less than 20 miles in width. We never saw the other side. And at least 60 miles in length, maybe much longer. Two entire counties of buffaloes. There might have been a hundred thousand or a million. I don't know. And that was no tall story. Probably no animals that have ever lived have gathered together in such incredible hordes. Buffalo, when on the move, would follow their leaders blindly, sometimes to disaster. George's Blonde, in his book, The Great Migrations of Animals, tells what happened to such a herd, a herd of a hundred thousand, when they were overtaken by a blizzard in the year 1858. For two days the storm had been raging, snow with violent wind and only a few yards of visibility. The wolves, guided by smell, followed the herd at a distance of less than 30 feet. But what guided the buffalo in front? They could see nothing but a whirling mass of snow. How did they know where they were going? Says the author, they didn't choose their destination, they submitted to it. Well, one thing is known about the buffalo. Whenever it started to snow, they spontaneously broke into a trot, pushing against the wind. They trotted at first, then changed to a sort of a single foot gait, which made the whole herd appear to limp. And eventually they slowed to a walk. They seemed to know, however, that they must not stop. So all night long that herd moved slowly on. The wolves were so close that they could touch the hind legs of the buffalo. But even the wolves were interested only in self-preservation that night. They had no urge to bite. All their energy was needed in the struggle to keep from being buried in the darkness. Somehow the herd survived the terrible night. Dawn found them still pushing against the snow. In late morning, the snow had lost some of its fury. The buffalo could trot again. No one knows how the frontline buffalo sensed that they approached a precipice. But suddenly there was a move to slow, a slowing that moved like a riptide back through the herd as stiffening legs tossed up the snow. A few buffalo or even a few lines of buffalo might have been able to stop within the 30 feet of visibility, but not a hundred thousand. The pressure of thousands of trotting locomotives behind them permitted those in front and in the back no escape. The whole herd to the last animal rolled over the cliff like a giant carpet. Some of the buffalo must have heard above the loud rustling of the wind the sound of those ahead plunging ninety feet to their death. But they may not have understood the sound. Buffalo and the march are not given to reflection, and there was nothing to stop the total disaster. But here is something interesting. As residents of the area in weeks to come visited the site of the tragedy, they found in the gigantic pile of skeletons the bones of not a single wolf. Those lean gray hunters must have stopped at the edge of the cliff, sniffed at the empty space, you see. Then sensing the banquet that awaited them below, they must have sought out safe paths to lead them to the lowland. Oh yes, friend, we pride ourselves that we're not of the senseless herd. Rather, with the smartness of the wolves, we would stop and sniff at the empty space, then turn aside. Then we'd find a safe path to the lowland. And there we would view the bones of the mindless ones and thank God that we were more discerning. But too many of us in the final hour will find that we were a part of the herd after all. The thunder of slipping feet will sound in our ears 
We shall look for a way of escape, but we shall be caught in the press from the left and from the right and from behind. And the mass of trotting locomotives behind will permit us scarcely to slow as we plunge headlong to a fate we never intended, never chose. We only submitted to it, but it'll be too late to cry. Judas Iscariot was not a desperado. He never killed anyone. His companions in the inner circle would have told you that he was a good man, exceptionally good. They would have freely admitted that he was the one most talented of the Twelve. His dynamic presence in their eyes lent a sort of status to the group. They felt that Jesus showed rare good judgment that you'd expect in the Messiah when he chose Judas as one of them. But the truth is, my friend, that Judas was never called, never drafted into the inner circle. He volunteered. Jesus didn't choose him. He tried to discourage him, but he didn't refuse him. The others would never have understood. And if Judas had died before that last trip to Jerusalem, his companions would have had no reason to change their estimate of him. They would never have guessed that under that polish of the perfect gentleman was a scheming, contriving nature, or that his restless fingers could not touch gold or silver without wanting it for himself or that his motive in connecting with Jesus was to make secure for himself a high place in the coming kingdom, they would never have guessed that Judas stood ready to jump clear at a moment's notice if the bandwagon showed signs of not going his way. Now, Judas, of course, would have described his problem quite differently. He would have told you confidentially that his problem was Jesus. Jesus didn't ride the waves of popularity and make the most of them as he should. He could have led a revolt against the Romans and taken the throne of David long before this, but he missed all the cues. When the people were ready to make him king, he simply disappeared. So Judas decided to do something about his problem. He worked out a unique and clever scheme for forcing Jesus to take the throne. And he fully expected that Jesus, when the power play had been successful, would generously reward him for his brilliant strategy. You see, Judas knew that Jesus would, could escape from any mob. He'd seen him do it. He knew that enemies could never take him against his will. So the plan was this. He would make a deal with those who sought the life of Jesus. They would think he was on their side and 30 pieces of silver would come his way in the process, you see. Jesus would be forced to free himself by a spectacular miracle, proving his divinity once and for all. The people would rally to his side, making him king, and Judas, of course, would get the credit. Friend, have you ever wondered why Jesus came, pardon me, why Judas came openly with the mob that Thursday night? Have you ever wondered? even stepped up to Jesus and kissed him? Tell me, if you were going to betray someone, would you go about it like that? Of course not. You'd keep out of sight. You'd be an unidentified source. You'd call in the information on one of those lines where informers can remain anonymous. But Judas walked right up to Jesus and kissed him repeatedly. He wanted to be sure Jesus knew he was there. He wanted to be sure that Jesus knew who was responsible for this brilliant move. By his treacherous kiss, he was saying, look, this is where you send the check. Judas simply couldn't believe that Jesus would let himself be taken. He watched expectantly for the miracle that he was sure would come. He heard Jesus ask his enemies who they were seeking. They responded, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. And as he spoke those words, an angel moved between him and the mob. A divine light, brilliant light, illuminated his face. The crowd staggered and fell to the ground. Priests, elders, soldiers, and Judas too. But Judas was jubilant. His plan was working. Here was the miracle. The mob could see that he was divine. And the same power that had thrown his enemies to the ground could keep them there, helpless, while he escaped. 
But Jesus made no move to escape. The mob started up, grew bold again, and Judas watched, terrified, terrified and angry, as Jesus permitted himself to be bound. Anxiously, the betrayer followed Jesus from the garden to the trial. Hour after hour, he waited for the big moment when Jesus would surprise his enemies, release himself. But the big moment never came. Judas began to realize that it never would come. He began to realize that he'd sold his Lord to his death. The torture of his guilt was unbearable. Suddenly, the trial neared its close. A hoarse voice rang out through the hall, sending a thrill of terror to every person. He is innocent. Spare him, O Cleophas. Tall form of Judas pressed through the startled crowd. His pale face was haggard and long. Rushing to the throne of judgment, he threw down the thirty pieces of silver. He grasped the robe of Caiaphas and cried out, I have sinned. I betrayed the innocent blood. But Caiaphas shook him off and answered scornfully, What is that to us? He fell now at the feet of Jesus and begged him to deliver himself. But Jesus spoke no word of reproach. But much as he loved the man weeping at his feet, there was nothing he could do. He knew that Judas didn't truly repent. He only feared the awful consequences of his dark deed. Judas now rushed from the hall, exclaiming, It's too late! It's too late! There was no way to stop the momentum of what he'd done. Like the buffaloes, there was no way out, no way back. The fuse he had lighted was burning shorter and shorter. Jesus was going to die, and Judas was horrified. Too late he discovered that the relentless, mindless march of circumstances that he'd set in motion knew no pity. Too late he discovered that it was he, Judas, not Christ, who'd been sold for thirty pieces of silver. I say too late he discovered that when it comes down to the wire, to the final bell, when the money at last has been thrown on the floor, there are no refunds or exchanges in the game of life. It was too late to cry. He could not bear to see Jesus crucified, and so he looked for a rope and hung himself to a tree. But that, but there is no rope strong enough to hold both Judas and his guilt. Listen. Listen, friend, Judas didn't grow up intending to become the betrayer, the Son of God. Mary, as a child, had no thought of becoming a lady of the night. The thief on the cross beside Jesus never intended to end up being executed. The woman at the well didn't grow up intending to have five husbands and end up living with a man not her husband. When David was a teenager, Remember, he killed a lion and a bear. He never dreamed that he would grow up to have a man killed so that he could take his wife. Barabbas never thought the day would come when an angry mob would be asked to choose between him and the Son of God. Even Lucifer never intended to become a devil abhorred by all the universe. None of these started out intending to go wrong. But somewhere along the line, each set his feet in the slippery path that leads to destruction. And some, and some made no effort to stop their fatal slide. Some never cried out for divine help. Some never came back. David was just as bad as Judas. His sin was so despicable that it was remembered to this day. But David came back. Mary came back. The woman at the well came back. The thief on the cross came back. That's the difference, the saving difference. Do you see? What matters is not how far you have gone, how despicable you have been or still are. It's the heart that's too proud to repent, that waits too long, that refuses to admit its need, that never comes back. That's the heart for which there is no hope. Listen, said Jesus over here in Matthew 9, verse 13. Matthew 9, 
Matthew 9, verse 13. Listen to these words of the Savior. I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus called sinners, and sinners came. And what a strange array of characters he chose to save. Mary the prostitute, Matthew the hated tax collector, the unnamed thief on the cross, David the murderer, and we could go on and on and on. But the religious ones who drew their robes about them, lest they be contaminated by such people, these were left out. They were left out because they chose to be left out, because they refused to admit that they were sinners. Yet Jesus could have saved them too. He longed to save them too. It was with breaking heart that he said to them, Matthew 21, verse 31, Matthew 21, verse 31, here's what he said. The publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. Now, there is no sin so great that it cannot be forgiven. God says so through the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 118, that wonderful verse back here, Isaiah 118. Listen to this. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And Jesus plainly said in John 6, verse 37, let's put it all together. John 6, verse 37, he said, he said, the man who comes to me, see, the man who comes to me, I will never turn away. And yet Jesus also said this in Matthew 12, verses 31 and 32. Matthew 12 again, verses 31 and 32, right here. He said, and so I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven either in this age or in the age to come. Is this a contradiction? No. No, every sin can be forgiven, he says, but the sin against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. What is this sin against the Holy Spirit that cannot be forgiven? What is the unpardonable sin? Is it some crime so offensive to God that he refuses to forgive it? No. He's freely pardoned murderers, adulterers, thieves. He delights in forgiving the worst of sinners. He's promised to forgive everyone who comes to him. But there's the key. What if they don't come to him? What if they don't repent? What if they don't ask to be forgiven? Don't even want to be forgiven? Even the smallest of sins can shut a man out if he refuses to admit his guilt. You see, if he has no desire for cleansing, no desire, there's another clue. And this is why the, this unpardonable sin is called the sin against the Holy Spirit. It is the Spirit, you see, that convicts us of sin, that reminds us that we're sinners, that urges us to repent. That, keep call, that keeps calling us back. The Holy Spirit is the voice of God to your soul. It's the only way God has of speaking directly to the inner man. Now, what happens when we refuse to listen to that voice? What happens if we reject the pleading of the Spirit again and again and again until finally the voice is silenced and we don't hear it anymore? What happens when we've gone beyond neglect? beyond procrastination, to a point where we no longer have any desire to come back. What then? Well, the Apostle Paul describes this fearful condition in 1 Timothy 4, verse 2. Be sure you remember this. Let's put it all together. Look, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, do you see now what the unpardonable sin is? It isn't any particular sin. It isn't the bigness of a man's sin that places him beyond hope. Rather, it is a condition in which the conscience doesn't work anymore. The Spirit of God has been forever silenced. See, like the alarm bell. 
the alarm clock, that you don't turn off day after day. Finally, you sleep through it. It is a condition in which a man no longer listens, no longer hears, no longer cares. That's when it's too late to cry. That's when a man has crossed the line but beyond which there is no coming back. For there is such a line. Millions will cross it. We dare not try to explain it away. Listen, there's a line by us not seen which crosses every path, the hidden boundary between God's patience and his wrath. To cross that limit is to die, to die as if by stealth it may not pale the beaming eye nor quench the glowing health. The conscience may be still at ease, the spirit light and gay. That which is pleasing still may please and care be thrust away. But on that forehead God hath set indelibly a mark by man unseen, for man as yet is blind and in the dark. Oh, where is that mysterious bourne by which each path is crossed, beyond which God himself hath sworn that he who goes is lost? How long may men go on in sin? How long will God forbear? Where does hope end? Where begin the confines of despair? An answer from the sky is sent. Ye who from God depart, while it is called today, repent and harden not your heart. Yes, friend, there is such a line. Millions will deliberately and defiantly choose to cross it, but other millions will cross it through neglect and procrastination, always intending to turn back, but never quite reaching the point of action. Like the buffalo of early American, they blindly follow those in front. They don't choose disaster. They simply submit to it, and then it's too late to cry. But thank God it doesn't have to be that way. The Lord Jesus Christ invites you to commit your life, your future, just now to the care of his hands, his wounded hands. They're the safest hands in all of the universe. They'll never lead you wrong. They'll never let you down, and they will lead you home. Listen to this. Lord, you left your throne and your kingly crown when you came to this earth that day. But in Bethlehem's home there was no room for your holy nativity.
Thank you, Marilyn Cotton. Shall we pray? Oh, what a Savior, always willing, always available, always capable of answering the faintest cry for help. So please, loving Lord, appeal to every heart this very moment that none will put off the decision, that none will refuse the invitation for eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I'm Lonnie Melashenko. Pastor Vandeman and I, and all of us at It Is Written, are hoping and praying that many of you will remember this telecast today as the hour of your commitment to Christ, a new commitment, a renewed commitment, or a more complete commitment. For all of you, for everyone listening, we have a gift. It is Pastor Vandeman's book, How to Live with a Tiger. How to Live with a Tiger, and we'll tell you in a moment how to ask for your copy. If you are a new Christian, you will want it. If you want to know how to become a Christian, it is for you. If you have problems in following Christ, you need it. And all of you will want to read Pastor Vandeman's account of his own encounter with the claims of Christ. Ask for the book by name, How to Live with a Tiger. And now here is the information you need. You may request Pastor Vandeman's free offer by writing directly to It Is Written, Box O, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. The offer is sent by mail free and postpaid. Our address is easy to remember. Just It Is Written, Box O, that's Box Zero, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. Please be sure to ask for the offer by name and we'll put it into the mail right away. It takes only a few moments to write, but it could mean a lifetime of satisfaction. While you're writing down the address, let me remind you to invite a friend to watch It Is Written with you next week on this station. The address again is It Is Written, Box O, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. Please mention the offer by name and write It Is Written, Box O, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. Thank you for your letters, your prayer requests, and your liberal support, which is so necessary in a television ministry like this. Thank you, Lonnie. Now the time has come all too quickly to say goodbye, everyone. But remember, it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God.